Well, we're going to hit the ground running today. I'm not going to do any introduction uh, because we've missed, uh, haven't been together for two weeks. I'm going to cover a little bit, uh, partly to review what we had done two weeks ago, but partly I think it's we need to hold this chapter 16 together, or 6 together. Uh, a, you weren't here for the, the 10 chapters that we did uh, in one week? That's what you missed last week, all 10 chapters. Of, you know, no, chapter 6. So, But we're going to start here at cha- then with uh, 6, 15, and 16, and then we'll, we're going to do a little uh, recap, but you'll see how that works out. Uh, it starts off in 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And that should look a little familiar to you because 6, chapter 6, verse 1 He asks the almost exact same starting question. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And what's happening is he's taking two different looks at uh, arguments that come up from what he's teaching. Both arguments come in and say, essentially, go ahead and sin. Go ahead and, and, and disregard the law. Forget about what you've been taught. It's all good by grace. Uh, and what Paul's trying to say as strongly as he can and almost as repetitively as he can in, in every avenue it's going to come in, exactly this, no. But the argument isn't just an argument that would come up in terms of uh, sort of biblical theology or religious theology. It's this argument that Satan has used from the beginning of time. Did God really say to you, don't do this. That question continues to ring through human history. Satan putting out the idea that it's okay to disregard what God said. He's just now coming at it through a different approach and using what Paul's argument is that we are no longer bound by the law in one context. And then uh, what would come from that is, well, then, then we should Go ahead and sin. Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Should we sin because so that grace could increase? And there's a certain part where you're reading that, if you have spent some time in faith, that where you would read that and go, well, that's just a ridiculous question. But it's not a ridiculous question because it's the societal question. What what can I get away with? What can what can I do? How where is that edge? Do I really have to obey the law? Whatever those questions are, these are what Paul's trying to to deal with. So I want to go back into the first part of chapter 6, because I think it's important that we see it as an entirety, and what we're actually going to have to do is see it in an entirety all the way through chapter 8, but that is probably six months from now. So, Well, no, probably a month from now. uh, So it says here, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He says, By no means... We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Hold on to that thinking that he's saying there. We have died to sin, so we can't live in sin. Uh, Even though you have grace there, you're not going to continue doing that. So then next set of verses, 5 to 7, and I've taken out a lot of stuff because you'll have to listen to last week's two weeks ago if you weren't here. Uh, but the piece that I want us to hold on to here is we know that our old self was crucified with him, Christ, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That's the piece here in chapter 6, verses 5 to 7. Then in six, 8 to 10... Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So to pull these pieces together here, this is what Paul's trying to get through to us in terms of how our position in terms of sin. We are those who have died to sin. We know that our old self was crucified with Christ so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. 
So what he's trying to do, he's talking to believers, he's trying to say this, remember who you are now. He is trying to get through to the reader, to us, the listener, remember who you are. Remember what's absolutely true about your position, your your role with God, your 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 ownership, who owns you, and it's going to we'll see in uh, in this next section when he's talking even more about who owns you now, because the early part is arguing that you have died to this stuff. So this is where we're at. This is uh, the. Um, the instructions that he, or the, the, the descriptions that he's given, and then ultimately it's going to end up here in the same way. This is the instructions that follow the remember who you are. Once he reminds us who we are, he's going to give us some instructions. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So remember who you are. Now, because of that, count yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Skip a little piece down to the very end there. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. So he's put together this piece to remind us that in our thinking, remember we're told, I don't pull a lot of stuff in from the outside, but we're told we have to change how we think. You've got to remember positionally who you are. And once you remember that, then that should define how you view sin and your own activity. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. So we have... These two pieces here, Romans 6, 15, and 16, ask that introductory piece. We're getting now to our new text. What then shall we say? It's the exact same question, but in a different context. What then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? And what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And in both of them, his answer is completely no. They by no means is a way of saying there's no way to rightly think that. There's no way to possibly consider that sin should be part of your allowance, part of your uh, understanding of yourself just because you're in grace. Grace covers sin, but it shouldn't allow it to become a part of who you think yourself as. That's what he's trying to initially get here. But by no means, there's no way to do that. So now we'll continue on with 15 and 16. So he's going to try to help us understand what he's been saying. Again, in another way, he's going to use an an example. Do you not know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? So he's taking now an example of slavery. He's bringing in a, an earthly example. He'll actually sort of apologize for using this example later, but it's what he's thinking of in terms of how do you show a human model of what's taken place in terms of your relationship to God versus your relationship to sin. So he says, don't you know when you offer yourselves to someone who's obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? So what comes next Whether you are, and there's two pieces. So I pulled them out for a second. You've got A and B on the screen. So now he's going to say, whether you are by choice, because remember, when you offer yourselves, it is now a choice prior to redemption and salvation. There's no choice in it at all. But now that you're saved, you have this option. When you offer yourselves to someone, whether you are A, slaves to sin or to obedience. Those are the only two options. There's not a series of, well, you can do this or you can do that. You can kind of find some middle ground. What he shows as two oppositional kind of of two sides of a coin. What you can either go this way or that way. There's you can't set the coin on the edge. You're either slaves to sin or you're slaves to obedience, implied obedience to Christ. So it narrows it down about as far as you can go. 
You're going to make a choice. You're going to offer yourself. At this point, when you have met and encountered Christ, you have two options. You're going to offer yourselves at this point as a slave to sin or to obedience. Slave to sin, which leads to death. To obedience, which leads to righteousness. Two pieces, two options. What I pulled out is almost all the text now. It says, don't you know, and see what it says in here? Slaves. You are slaves. You are slaves. You pull out in 15 and 16 everything except what it's using as a defining factor. The defining factor is your slaves. That one you don't have a choice in. He doesn't present an option of, well, you can either just be your own person or you can be a slave to sin, or you can be a slave to obedience. There's no choice of just, I'm going to follow me. I'm going to do my own thing, which is something you hear in the world a lot. Well, I'm not really into that religious thing. I, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to make my own way. I'm the commander of my own ship. Paul would say nonsense. You have two choices. You're a slave. That's not in the choice option. You are a slave. The options then comes as what you're slaves to. You're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or you're slave to obedience, which leads to righteousness. So in those two contexts, slavery is, is a given. Remember Bob Dylan's song, You Gotta Serve Somebody? Were you singing? Oh. <laughs> I'd love to hear your Bob Dylan impression, but we'll, play it. we'll hold that till later. <laughs> The one man on earth who can't sing as well as I can, but he's much more famous. So, but you've got the you you don't have that option. You've got to serve somebody. You're going to serve sin, or you're going to serve obedience. So, the interesting part is, notice up there in the light blue that's underlined, you are the decider. In this, we haven't gotten through chapter seven and eight, so, and, we, and, and that will help us redefine this even a little bit more. But as you're, if you're receiving this letter, what, what Paul, you're reading along, and what you're going to see here when you're getting this news from Paul, I'm going to be a slave, but you choose to wear. How that plays out later, we'll get to that. But for this moment, where we're at, chapter six, fifteen and sixteen, don't you know that you offer yourselves as slaves? To sin leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. So then he has this interesting little thing, but thanks be to God. He is adding, a, he's bringing God into the equation. God's never been out of the equation, but you could read this part and, and go, well, it's just, it's entirely up to you. It's not. Outside of the death of Christ, there wouldn't be even any options here. But you, when he says you offer yourselves, he's going to, he throws this in here now, starting on 17. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart. So he's talking now about the transition that's happened in their salvation experience. They were slaves to sin unequivocally. They, they've met Christ. You have come to obey from your heart. And then there's this interesting statement. <clears throat> well, actually, let me, uh, uh, one little insert before we get to the interesting statement. Notice, I'm pulling in a verse. I'm cheating. Ezekiel 36, 26. Notice what it says. I will give you a new heart. Skipping a little piece because we'll come back to that later in a couple of uh, weeks, actually. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So that ability didn't exist prior to being saved. Prior to encountering Christ, there was no ability to have a new heart, so they couldn't come to obey from their heart. What this piece, the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. It's an unusual description of salvation. The pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Now, why I'm pointing this out at all is this. When you do a quick read through many biblical texts, Romans being a prime example, you miss a lot of stuff. There's so many different little pieces that are packed in here that you would probably read through Romans 6, 17, and 18 and never stop and go, what's the, the pattern of teaching? Why, why, you've come to obey from your heart. Why didn't he just say Jesus? 
Why didn't he just say God's truth, but he says instead the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance? And the reason why he says this is there were a lot of teachings out there, and there were a lot of bad teachings out there. And when he's talking in terms of a pattern of teaching now, the, what he's trying to describe is the pattern is the right doctrine of Christ. They have encountered the right doctrine of Christ, and it has claimed their allegiance. They have made a commitment to follow the correct doctrine. It doesn't mean that doctrine is what led them to salvation in any sense. But what Paul's trying to say here is it absolutely matters that you understand the truth. There's a whole bunch of variants out there, and there were as many then, there's almost as many then as there are now. Of weird little offshoots of things that you can believe and, 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 and ways that you can, can get steered aside. And what Paul's saying here is, thanks be to God that you used to be slave to sin, but now you've come to obey in your heart the truth about Jesus Christ. And that's the truth that he's talking about. Yes, Betty. Uh, uh, this is so good to come up right now because back a couple of verses when you're talking about you've come to obedience. Mm -hmm. And my thinking immediately thinks, well, there's, there's another set of rules. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. I immediately want to think that. And what Betty just said is that when it says that you've come to obedience, that, well, here's another set of rules. And and not to tip my hand too much. I figured you'd get to it. So that well, no, no, it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> we, as grace-loving, Jesus-loving Christians, yes. want to sort of set rules aside. They feel oppressive. They feel religious. And I'm going to say this. There are rules. It, there are still rules. And they absolutely matter. But we have to view them differently. We can't view them as these strange restrictions on our lives that we have to hold absolutely true to or God won't love us. That's not it. And what we'll see as we go through this, so just this is where I'll show my cards a little bit, is what has to happen is this change in a sense of I want to do what God wants me to do. So it isn't specifically rule sets as obedience to God's desire for you. Yes, Jerry? Paul well, set the stage for this in chapter 1, uh -huh. where he said, I'm an apostle called to bring the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith. Yes. So it's not just a separate set of rules, but it's obedience. Yes, that, 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 that call the Gentiles to obedience. And, and the, the reason why what, what Jerry's saying that, that's, is Paul sets the stage at the very beginning. Obedience is what matters in terms of you have to transform yourself. But it's not obedience to a weird rule book. It's obedience to the God that you love and serve and are slave of. However you choose to look at it, oh, I'm a slave or I'm a, I'm a child of God. Both terms are used in Scripture. We're friends of God. We, he loves us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's not dismissing obedience. He's making it the central piece of our action in our faith. And that's what he's talking about here. When he's talking about the Gentiles, they had rules that just didn't apply. And that's why they needed to be brought into the set of obedience to the right thing. All right, so you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. This is a precursor of what, how, how that all plays out. You, you are set free from sin. You are not set free from being righteous. And righteous means to do things the right way, right? At one level, when we've talked, righteousness means to be correctly lined up with God, to be correctly following. But to do that, this is where if you're in this conversation of, well, does the law apply anymore? Absolutely the law applies, but it applies in a very different way. It doesn't apply there to show sin, but it does still reflect God's character and his desire for how we are to live in many ways. So you've been set free from sin. Thanks be to God. You used to be slaves to sin. You have been set free from sin. You have become slaves to righteousness. So we have the starting question again. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And he's doing exactly the same thing. He's saying, remember who you are. You used to be slaves to sin. You've been set free from that. And now you're slaves to righteousness. We want to stop at the second piece. 
The, the, the modern Christian wants to say, I, I used to be a slave to sin. I've been set free from it. Hallelujah. That third piece is equally important. That third piece Paul's bringing in and saying there's, there is no getting out of righteousness. What needs to take place as we get further into 7 and 8 is this transformation of your heart where righteousness is your desire because you desire to belong 100% to God. So then he is, this is where he does a little bit of an apology for sort of the, the crudeness of the example that he uses. He says, I'm using an example from everyday life. It's the slavery piece. Talking in terms of slavery has its limitations as a metaphor. It's as particularly in modern times where slavery had become such a, an institution of oppression. That's not the intent of this in any way. Slavery was a different model back then. But even then, he's saying it was a, it's a crude example. It's a poor example. But he's using it. And, and this is, is Paul's not never plays soft because of your human limitations. The New American Standard, the more direct translation, says because of the weakness of your flesh. Why NIV would change that is we haven't hadn't told really what flesh is yet. So what he's trying, what NIV is trying to do is make it a little bit more understandable. How just our inability to understand God, he's needing to put it into kind of crude, simple terms for us at this point. <clears throat> so he's using an everyday example because of our limitedness at this time. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness. Now, when you read this, it's not because necessarily with knowledge that they're doing that. It's just because of the sinful nature. Before they're saved, they are offering themselves as slaves to impurity, not because they're going, hey, God, forget you. They're just not connected to God. Yes? I like all these last, like, I don't know, five or six verses because um, a lot of times I don't do it intentionally, but there's sort of a sliding scale of goodness when you look at people, especially people I know that don't serve the Lord. Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, he's so good, he's so kind, and all, you know, all this kind of thing. And this is saying it's binary, like it's a non off switch. Yeah. And that's really helpful to me. Like, if you're not serving Jesus, like, whether you mean to or not. Right, and it will say that even more. But I mean, what Don's saying is that there's a sense uh, that this helps see it just as an either or, not a progressive scale. Because we all know people who aren't saved who are nice people, they're kind people. They they give money to help homeless puppies or whatever it is they do. Uh, there, there are lots of sort of kindnesses out there, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about righteousness, not kindness. And we'll get to that even more. But this part here, just as you used to offer yourselves to slaves to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, was, was just the way of life in pri or prior to knowing Christ. But now he says, so now, the way that you used to, without understanding, offer yourselves in this way. So now, remember, was in the first set, we had this, remember who you are, and I'm going to give you instructions. And so we just had it again, the remember who you are, and now he's going to give you some instructions. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness. This is a command. This is a direct statement. This is a, what Don said. It's a, it's a binary option here. You're, you, you can still offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, we'll answer what the outcome of that is a little bit more later, but he tipped his hand earlier, right? Says that leads to death. Or he can make the choice that is to desire to love and serve God and place yourself as a slave to God. And we don't think this way. God owns us. We, we still think of ourselves as independent agents. We're supposed to to put ourselves where we are owned by God. Yes, Janine. Well, a real important part for me that's sticking out is where you said in the, the previous section, um, let's see, where, where you said, come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. That has to happen first, right? And yeah. You're, because your allegiance righteous yet, but first I have to claim my, my allegiance to correct teaching. Yeah, well, to, 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 the, to correct 
person of Christ. You, you can't take a watered-down Christ. You can't take a, 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 a modern-day gospel. The correct gospel teaching, you've, you've heard that, and you've committed yourself to that, and then it leads to this. It leads to this choice. How am I going to live? Francis Schaeffer had a book that said, How Then Shall We Live? And it's, it's based on how, how are we going to live now that we understand Christ rightly And because there's still a choice to make. Yes, Betty. Well, that's what's so simplistic, I think, but the thing that's helped me about studying this a lot has been the idea, and it is isn't I even thought about it before, but it's been clear, that sin is an entity. It's a state of being mm -hmm. that's just in the works. Yeah. And it isn't specific behaviors exactly. That's the fruit of it. Yes. But sin is the entity. Yes, it's a. I I like the word condition. It's a, it's a condition of of your heart. It's it would be wrong to say it's a because entity means like a person. Although I pers I also have described it that way. I mean yes, you have Satan, but it's 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 a position yeah, of your heart. Yeah. And then all the activities. That's what he's saying here. You offered yourselves to slave to impurity and ever increasing weakness. Those are the actions. But the the issue yeah. is the the ownership, the, the slavery. Is the, the issue of it being there. Yes. Yeah. But righteousness is there too. Well, we'll get to that. Yes, the option, the two options are there. So it's, uh, this is his command. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, because remember, you only have two slavery choices: slaves to sin and purity, or slaves to righteousness, which leads to holiness. Okay, so now we've got it leading to holiness. We've started off and something leads to righteousness and now it leads to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, this is an odd statement, you were free from the control of righteousness. It's a weird statement to me. You were free from the control of righteousness. In the past, righteousness wasn't an issue for you at all. To be right, re, rightly related with God wasn't an issue. And this is where what Don is talking about comes in. This is why social morality isn't what matters. This is why you can run all the, all the social justice campaigns you want, all the canned food drives you want, and all, all the sort of, it's not talking about social morality. It's not talking about goodness. It's talking about ownership. It's talking about your positional place. And so here, if you offer yourself as a slave to righteousness, being right with God, righteousness isn't a set of behaviors. It's reflected in those behaviors, but it's not a set of behaviors. Righteousness is a place that I choose to be, which means I'm going to do what I know pleases God, as opposed to I'm going to do anything else, anything else. Now, you could go, well, well what, it pleases God to feed the guy on the corner, right? No. It pleases God, the desire to please God. And then feeding the guy in the corner comes out of that. So if you leave that internal step, or that central first step out, my desire is to please God, so I'm going to go and feed that guy in the corner. That's, that doesn't qualify, because you're still offered as a slave to impurity, slave to sin. You have to make the positional switch to a slave to righteousness, which then leads to holiness. Let me make sure I'm not skipping something here. Okay. So it moves on to 6, 21 and 22. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? It isn't saying there's no benefit. It's asking what the benefit was. He's setting up a cost-benefit analysis here. There are benefits from sin that please the sinful nature. There are benefits from sin and, and living in that position because you can have the sense of being in control of your own life. You can have the sense of being free and you can have the sense of all kinds of things. You're not any of those things, but you can. there are all kinds of benefits. He's not saying there's not, but he's asking you to take into account what benefit did you get from living in a sinful slavery because here it is, those things result in death. So, to use crude, earthly examples, I've never used heroin. That's not a confession, it's just a fact. I've got to believe there's something pretty s stimulating about using heroin because of people that use it, and then they use it again. Or any number of things. 
But if the person who ultimately dies of a heroin overdose were able to go all the way back and, and say, what benefit did you get from that, and are you willing to die for it? Whatever sort of pleasure that cause, are, are you willing to pay the ultimate price of death? Somebody who uh, has, uh, has lived their life in such a way that just a rough living, whatever you want to call it, and ultimately they die when they're in their whatever age, and, and, and they can look back and say, I died, I lost my life because of this behavior, and they were able to evaluate, was it worth it? That's what Paul's saying here. You have to go, oh, you were living this way, but it ends in death, and not just physical death, eternal death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have been slave, become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. Now this holiness is this conformed in all things to the will of God. Holiness means to be set apart. The, the actual little, literal translation of the word means to be, to be set apart conformed in all things to the will of God. Why I like this definition is, this is where if you choose to be a slave to God, that means you're making a conscious decision, I want everything in my life to conform to His will. Not some of my life to conform to His will, everything in my life to conform to His will. That's what it should look like. That now that you've been set free from sin and you're slaves of God, the benefit you reap will lead to holiness, being conform to God's will, and the result, eternal life. So this, <coughs> excuse me, I went back one slide. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? The answer to that is, a, is an implicit no because you can't be holy and it won't lead to eternal life. And if that's your desire, then you have to go, of course he's going to say, Absolutely not. So the result is eternal life. One second. <coughs> Excuse me. Something has decided I want to come through the back of my throat. <coughs> wow. All right. Lord, save me. Okay. So it ends not quite yet. Not quite yet. If you're looking ahead, you're cheating. For the wages of sin is death. We know this verse, right? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what he's doing now is he's setting out the two end point options. He didn't do it at the beginning because if you read it at the beginning, you would just go, well, of course, I want, I want eternal life. I want, I want eternal life. And, and you'd stop reading. What, what he's done at now is he said, I'm going to tell you everything that is entailed in getting to the place where you can get the gift of God. In our society, in our modern Christian doctrines, where we have landed is free, cheap grace. Just believe. Just believe. And I, I remember... As clear as though it was just yesterday, I was at a memorial service uh, in high school. I, I guess I don't know quite as clear as just yesterday because I can't remember what year in high school, but I remember it was in high school. And I went to a memorial, and in the memorial page, it talked about his date of baptism. And that was the confirming evidence that this person would be in heaven, was the date of their baptism. Now, I knew this person, and I knew how this person lived. And even then, I'd known the Lord for a year, maybe two. Even then, I remember reading that and listening to the memorial and thinking, I don't think so. And it's not my job to judge whether someone's in heaven or not, but I, this man was everything you, if you saw him just from the outside and you didn't read the baptism thing, you, you would assume that this guy knew Jesus as much as I know somebody I've never met in my life. He had no reflection of God. And our desire to have God's love be bigger than, than and, and more applicable than he's allowing it to be. His love is infinite and large, but the application of it is very specific and intentional. We want it to be, 
all you had to do somewhere along the line is say, yep, I, I believe in Jesus. And that's what Paul's trying to get away from. That's why he comes not until the end of this section where he says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What you have to make a decision is who do you want to be a slave to? You can't just say the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. Which do you want? Oh, well, I want eternal life. Without understanding that implicit in that is a life of slavery to God. It's an internal statement. So Paul's saying twice in this chapter, remember who you are now. He's reminding them of their position and of their, of their redemption and of, the, of everything that's been done for them and that they have a new character. They have a new heart, but that new heart has to make a decision of where it's going to live. Remember the benefits of both. Benefits of sin are many. They are. But the cost is eternal. The benefits of a life of indentured servitude, of slavery, whatever word you want, to God, the benefits are also many, but they're very different from worldly benefits. Very, very different. Choose to live as you are. I don't remember who said this, but uh, I've heard it several times in sermons. I've used it in a sermon. But uh, uh, at some point when a, a kid's misbehaving in some sort of way, uh, and I've heard it ascribed to Alexander the Great, but I've never found that, that in historical context, but, and I've heard it assigned to generals and families and all kinds of things. But at some point, somebody's being a complete knucklehead, and the person who's uh, in their family or their hist historical uh, connection comes up to him and says, look, if you're going to keep living this way, you've got to change your name because you can't keep the name and behave that way. That's, that's what Paul's saying. You're not a Christian because you say you're a Christian. You're a Christian because you made a decision to choose to live the positional life that God has given you. Or you can choose to live still indentured to slavery and sin. But if you choose that, the outcome is death. Now, what ultimately is being said in chapter 6 here is you can claim Christ and still go to hell. That's what he's saying. Because he's writing to Christians. And he's teaching to, to Christians, at, at least intellectually Christians. We'll have to understand chapter 7 and 8 to understand all this. But he's not writing to pagans. He's writing to people who, who are reading his letter because it's coming from Paul who's connected to God and knows Jesus Christ. And so they're reading this with the intention and understanding of, I, I'm trying to learn about my own life, just like we are. But what he's saying is, just haven't been baptized when you're a kid. Just raising your hand at camp. Just having assigned a sheet somewhere doesn't get you into heaven. Being a slave of God and having the desire to have your life completely conform to his, that's where it comes out. If that's how you live, that leads to eternal life. So any questions on that before I go to the last slide? Thank you for the water. Okay. Homework. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm going to give a little precursor to our homework. Dave? Yes, sir. Let me just, uh, Matthew 7, 21 23, the end piece of what you just said, that going to heaven, uh, being transformed into the position of the Matthew, say, I, I'm, I don't know, it's my hearing age. 21 to 23. Oh, okay. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Mm. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will get in heaven, but only those who do... Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great verse. Um, <clears throat> there's lots, we can, there are, there are lots of, lots of evidence, Jesus' evidence, Paul's evidence, Peter's evidence, uh, that just thinking you're a Christian doesn't mean you're a Christian. Putting a fish on your bumper sticker doesn't, doesn't do it either. So for, why I have homework coming up, I almost never do. Personally, I believe chapter 7 and 8 of Romans might be the two most in important outside of understanding that Jesus Christ died on the cross and understanding Jesus' life. So the, outside of this understanding the Gospels, understanding what takes place in the human experience of faith, chapter 7 and chapter 8. Chapter 7 by itself leads to all kinds of problems. Chapter 8 without chapter 7 leads to some misunderstandings. 
I think they're the two most difficult chapters I can think of to teach on. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is read Romans chapter 7 this week in its entirety three separate times, not the same time. Not just read it three Read it once, prayerfully. When you do this, say, Lord, I need to understand this. If for no other reason than Dave saying I might go to hell. That, that won't be, but read, read chapter 7. Don't read chapter 8 right now. We need to understand chapter 7. We're going to take a couple, and we might spend three weeks, I don't know, we're going to spend two or three weeks on just chapter 7, then we're going to do chapter 8. But I want you to read all the way through chapter 7. The first section, the illustration from marriage, is helping bring us some more understanding from chapter 16. From verse 7 on, it's, it's still giving us more understanding, but it, he takes a pretty rapid change of explanation of what's happening. I want us to try and get our minds around what, what is Paul communicating from his own life and his own experience in terms of biblical theology. We won't understand it entirely until we read 8, but please don't read 8 yet. Just read 7, three times, three separate events. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. I'm going to grade you when we come back. But if you haven't done it, you still come. So it'll be it'll, It's going to be on the test, but not the one I'm going to give you. So God, thanks for today. Help us understand this. I believe as I look around the room that our desire is to be completely rightly related to you, to be slaves of the Most High God, not out of fear, but out of love, not out of a knowledge that there is no better place to be. Help us with that. Help us understand these next couple of chapters as we work our way through and ask that you would keep it from being theology. Help it to be the word of God that brings life and truth. In Jesus' name, amen.